Okay. Um, so big data. Um, is it really something meaningful or is it just hype? That's, uh, that's the question. And um, I just want to set up a little bit of parameters. Uh, there's going to be another panel tomorrow that I'm going to uh, lead, which is about machine learning and uh, the machine learning challenges regarding big data. Today, the, it's more the big picture. What is big data? What are the challenges? And so on. So um, um, I will um, bring in some questions and uh, to, to set the direction. But uh, you're all very welcome to walk up to one of the microphones, or maybe somebody can hand you a microphone and um, ask your own question. OK, so big data. The term big is a subtle way to say that it's not small. Um, so uh, the question is, what, how big is big? What does big, uh, really, what does big data really signify? What is the new thing that is separating, let's say, big data from what uh, a few years ago was um, data mining? Data mining was also seen as huge data. So now it's big because it's not so huge. So um, OK, um, Owen, why don't you start? Sure. Well, l l let me take a particular uh, topic here, which is one of my favorites. I, I don't know what the difference is between uh, d data and, and mining and big data. And so a lot of uh, terms uh, thrown around. Uh, I've been working on this since big data was just small data. <laughs> but uh, I do think that here's one distinction one can draw, which is what if you can't afford to label, uh, hand label, right? any but a very small fraction of your data, mm -hmm. uh, then surely you have some, some pretty big data. And that means that you need to have uh, very different algorithms uh, to think about. So one class of big data is when you can't afford to manually label it. OK. Maybe Shai? So trying to think about what is big data, for me, the easiest thing is to, to think about other things and trying to compare. So I think. The best comparison that I can come up with is electronic commerce. So electronic commerce sort of started 15 years ago, give or take some time. And we can look after 15 years what has happened to it as a discipline and as a research discipline. So first of all, it's sort of as an industry, it's up, it's alive, it's well. And it's mainly integrating over a common infrastructure, a few technologies. On the one side, you have search. On the other side, you have auctions and electronic, uh, electronic auctions. And so, so as far as an industry perspective would go, it's, it's all about integrating. And I think when we some of the talk today made it even clearer that from an industry perspective, the big data would be a lot about integrating various technologies on a common infrastructure. As far as setting a common research agenda for the entire big data, this is a much, for me, it's a much trickier issue. And looking on electronic commerce, you can see that although it's like a well-established industry, I'm not sure how many billions they make each year, but as a research discipline, it's still fragmented. The information retrieval is on one side, the auctions and mechanism designs on the other side, security and communication always go somewhere. So, so, so from my perspective, big data is about integrating a lot of things on, the, on a common infrastructure. As a research discipline, I'm more skeptical whether in 10 years from now, we'll really have a discipline which would be called big data. Okay. Jeff? Yeah, a, a tricky question. I mean, if you listen to my talk this, uh, this morning, um, I consider the, that the, uh, the drug interaction problem was big data, even though the volume of data was actually quite small, because the amount of computation that was necessary uh, was enough to, uh, you know, to, to make your, the, the algorithmic problem very, very uh, difficult. Um, I think what's, what intrigues me about what is, quote, called big data is that there are certain applications where the, the you, you, you need the, the more data you have, the higher the quality of your results. Um, I think a, a, a good example 
uh, is statistical machine learning. The bigger the database you have of, uh, of translated sentences, uh, the better job you can do with translation. You can't do it at all with a, you know, a, a small corpus. Uh, uh, I think to a, to a, a great extent, uh, things like uh, the Netflix problem, the recommendation systems in general, uh, the more data you have, the better the recommendations you can do. Um, so, so that's, uh, I, to me, that's, that's why all of a sudden people are getting excited about doing stuff with more and more data. Okay. Uh, for me, uh, for me, big data came in uh, in a very uh, palpable way when I started to take pictures uh, with a digital camera rather than a film camera. Uh, the moment, the moment, pictures start to accumulate in huge databases, and and uh, and uh, and the moment all these all these pictures become an unmanageable uh, mass of 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 images, they cannot be labeled, and this uh, this uh, is a very important observation. They cannot be labeled properly. They cannot be they cannot be uh, classified in a nice way. And therefore, for me, big data is, in fact, this uh, huge accumulation of, 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 uh, of pieces of information that, that, that is being, uh, that is being um, accumulated in a completely disorderly way. And it goes into, into places, and they become non-retrievable because of their very mass. And, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the good old times, we used to say that with good priors, who needs the data? Now, we have so much data that we need no priors, but we don't know how to take out the relevant things from the huge masses of data. And this is, I think, the major mm -hmm. problem that we are facing. Okay. I, ju I just wanted to follow yeah. up one thing that you said. I, th I think you might find this interesting. Uh, Google recently announced that every minute, a hundred hours of video are uploaded into YouTube. Just think about, so this is your problem, but in uh, Google scale. A hundred hours uploaded every minute. Right. So, yeah, so those are uh, several uh, ways. I want to maybe try to think about it in a different way. Um, what well, Jeff, when you gave the talk today about the about how to optimize the um, MapReduce, it wasn't really about reducing com computation. It was about reducing communication. And uh, to me, it seems like communication is, um, is, an important, um, is an important new part in it. And uh, I just wonder what people uh, think about how can you relate communication and computation in these big problems. Any, you can, anyone that wants to answer, you don't have to answer. No, no answer on that, okay. I, I, should, I should remind you, I mean, all honesty, that is MapReduce. The nature of MapReduce uh -huh. is that there's a lot of communication required. Right. There are a lot of, by the way, a lot of other applications also that require uh, in, in large investments in communication. I think that's what the IBM Blue Gene device, for example, is, uh -huh. is really about. It's, it's it's something that that puts most of its uh, its cost into the switch rather than the uh, compute nodes. Uh, you know, so there definitely are problems that where mm -hmm. communication is a bottleneck. But but uh, uh, different. Uh, you know, there are other things besides Hadoop, and in many of these things, in fact, communication is not the issue at all. I see. Uh, can, can you say a little bit more what, what uh, things no, are? No, no, I cannot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so, so I think in general, many things in, in computer science are driven by sort of the trade-off, sort of between CPU, cost of CPU, cost of storage, and cost of, of bandwidth. This was like, you can see, when you look back, you'll see that the new technology and communication network coming up when the, this, when this trade of sort of changes. When you look at the price of a bit in storage versus the price of a cycle in the CPU, 
when these sort of changes, new technologies come up. Come up. Mm -hmm. I think sort of for big data, I had a hard time finding a good example what it would really mean when, when we sort of have a switch, let's say, what would mean if the cost of CPU would double or half compared to storage? Would we have a different set of agenda? Um, the cost of uh, CPU, I think that the cost of uh, storage versus uh, communication, okay. not, not CPUs, but the cost of storage versus communication is very out of whack. Basically, many places say, yes, you have a database and it will not move. Basically, it's going to stay exactly where you stored it because it's just too much, too much effort to, to move it to, uh, to a different place. So, so the, the fundamental question you can maybe ask is, uh, uh, suppose that you have uh, a set of uh, computers on different machines with very limited communication between them uh, and you want to solve some joint problem. What is, um, what is a way that will be efficient both in terms of communication and in terms of computation. So what's the limit? It has more to do, I guess, maybe with questions in information theory about um, multi-agent multi communication. So, so maybe a better motivation for communication would be, uh, would be if you think sort of, of a privacy issue, think about hospitals and patients, mm -hmm. and you'd like to learn something across hospitals, so, so you have a communication issue, but I think your real issue is privacy. And, and sort of many of the privacy issues sh should be coming up with big data. They are coming up. It will, and they'll probably be more prevalent as applications would be up there. Right. So you'd like to sort of, <coughs> definitely you'd like hospitals to share patient information in order to do, let's say, a search like Elad talk about mm -hmm. a disease. On the other hand, there are regulations and there are privacy issues that prevent them. How right. do you do sort of machine learning in face of privacy? It's, I think it's a, a wonderful research area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to add to that. I, I think that the reason that people talk a lot about this term, right, it's, it's um, hype now and then people say, is it overhyped? I don't know if that necessarily matters, but it's <coughs> less about the fundamentals and whether they've changed and more about that uh, people perceive that there are amazing applications in terms of prediction, in terms of personalization, that can make a real difference to people, right? So there was recently the hurricane in uh, Oklahoma where a lot of people were killed because they failed to predict the, the path, mm -hmm. right? Maybe with more data they could have, or uh, predictive policing is now very popular in the United States. They just rolled it out in Seattle where they believe they can anticipate where certain crimes uh, are gonna happen. At the side, we you know we predict prices. Mm -hmm. uh, Google is trying to do uh, personalization with Google now, right? It'll anticipate what you want before you even ask for it. All these things are uh, people are starting to perceive, right? There's uh, amazing applications that have this property, right? With more data, mm -hmm. this is more data I can do better. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that I mean I think that at this point we're still talking about the things that are relatively people are willing to share, you know, uh, uh, the, um, b the recommendations or uh, what is it called, uh, Waze, uh, this application that everybody keeps telling me about here. And, uh, but, but these are things that people are sharing that are relatively, you, you don't mind sharing with a stranger. Once you get to uh, medical records or even to education, um, I think that there's much, much more sensitivity as to what all of this big data exists, but how much am I allowing Big Brother to see it? So, um, so I, guess, I guess maybe I'll just make it an explicit question. Anybody can see a particular um, type of algorithmic questions or uh, algorithmic agenda that regards big data? So maybe from my perspective, the way that I see it is yes and no. Okay. <laughs> and, and the yes is sort of... You're becoming right. good politicians. <laughs> <laughs> in a country in which you don't <laughs> want to be one. <laughs> yes, be, because right, say, let's say you want to run SVM and you want to run SVM on a huge data set, just running the old convex uh, quadratic program is, is not going to fly. 
So, so even if you want to run other booths and you want to do it mm -hmm. in parallel, I spent some time thinking about it. It's not that simple if you really want to, to, to get a very high parallelism for mm -hmm. me. So, so, so in fact, sort of the challenge is clear. It's probably old because it's coming from parallelism, but it, it has a very new and good motivation. Mm -hmm. The no part is that I'm not, I'm still not convinced that we have like a totally new problem that we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th three words: locality sensitive hashing. Okay. Um, this is the idea that uh, I think has amazing power, and that it's it's not machine learning, so people don't really think of it as a big data algorithm. Yeah. Issue. What? It's, near its, neighbor. it's something like that, right? The, the, uh, if you haven't seen it before, it's chapter three of the uh, free online book that that uh, Roger Raman Leskovich and I did. Uh, the, the idea is uh, you have a large set of things. Uh, let's just take an example, entity resolution, where you have uh, enormous files of records. The records represent people. They come from different sources. You don't know who is who. Uh, just because they have the same name doesn't mean they're the same person. Uh, just because the name is misspelled in one record doesn't mean they're different people. Uh, you know, but you've got, I don't know, let's say 100 million records. You can't compare each record with each other record. I don't care whether you do it in parallel or map reduce it or, or anything. There's just too much data, too many pairs of things to actually look at at every pair. You have to focus on the ca things that are likely candidates. Okay, so there are, uh, a, there are a number of algorithmic tricks known that will let you do this pretty well. Uh, I think there are still some huge uh, open questions in, again, how you, it, how you take an enormous data set, and you know, by enor enormous, I'm, you know, I'm talking about 10 million, 100 million objects, find the, uh, or more, of course, and, and find the things that are, by some measure, similar without having to look at every pair. Uh, again, right. there's a, it's, a, it's a great technology. It's the technology I find people need and don't know uh, more often than any other. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, so that's Locality my two cents. sensitive hashing, yeah. So, um, so you're s basically you're suggesting it as a way of pruning the pairs that you're going to choose. Well, it, I mean, that's what it does. The yeah. algorithms that are called locality sensitive hashing do let you focus on the pairs that are likely to be similar without having to look at, look at every pair. Right. And, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a terrific bag of tricks. There's still plenty of room for more tricks. Mm -hmm. um, maybe from uh, one of the things that really interests me is from an educational point of view, um, there is uh, from the McKinsey report from last year, there's uh, foreseen to have like um, in by 2018 uh, require, um, a demand for about 50,000 data analysts in the United States. So the question is, what do they need to learn? Do, do they really, are they going to be computer science um, students? Are they going to be statistics students? Are they going to come from business? Uh, business, in, I mean, in engineering management? Um, what, what, what do you guys think? Okay, so <laughs> it seems that, okay. So so from my experience, sort of talking with a few times with people who really needed data analysts is this. I'm not, okay. Maybe in the long run, we'll have a much better idea what they would like to have. But in the short run, my feeling at the end when I, with, with specific people who said that they needed for large company data analysts, it seems that the reason they, that they are not taking computer science graduate is cost. Mm. So it's somewhere between a a, an excellent programmer and a QA guy, you want to have a data analyst. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that this is the way to, to really build a new profession, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, but it's clear what they need to know, right? They need to know statistics, they need to know computer science, and they need, and rather than programming, right, the usual programming, they need sort of a different kind of playing with data. 
Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to just yeah. add, I, I do think that the most important thing they need, and it's definitely the case that not all computer science majors have it, probably not all statistics majors have it too, is a certain attitude. The last thing you said about playing with data. I've, I've seen developers that just say to me, okay, what should I build? I say, well, I don't know what to build. You need to right. look at the data, quote, listen to the data, analyze the data, and it's an iterative process, and they're stuck. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there's real room for teaching people how to do experiments and how to iterate in, in this fashion. And there's also emerging degrees. I think Stanford has mm -hmm. one, right, in whatever, data science, and mm -hmm. we're developing one in the University of Washington. No? Nothing I'm involved in, certainly. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll check. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the I don't yeah, know, maybe, maybe the there should be. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I think that what you said is a point about people that are happy to play with data. Many times, what I see is actually these are people that come from the sciences. So if they're physicists, experimental physicists, or experimental biologists, neurologists, neuroscientists, those are the people that basically work with some machinery, generate a huge amount of data, and then they need to analyze it enough to even ask the reasonable questions. So, so yeah, I think that there would be a very nice thing to, to somehow add it, but, but it's somehow an attitude. It's a, it's a different thing. Like, it's one attitude is, just tell me what you need and I'll build it, and the other is, uh, what is this interesting thing that's going on? It's very different. So, if, you, if, I, may, if yeah. I may say something, you, you are asking what these guys should be. I think I have an answer what these guys should not be. Okay. They shouldn't be as stupid as those that we have today who publish <laughs> statistical interpretations of the data in the newspapers, uh -huh. uh, uh, finding correlations where there are none. Uh -huh. And uh, therefore, I think, I think they have to be well-trained in, in, in uh, well-trained professionals in any one of these of right. these disciplines that you are mentioned, and they should be smart people, okay? Mm. That's, that, 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 that is something that, uh, that is a prerequisite that you cannot do away with. Okay, okay, but that's more of a, like a, a filtering prerequisite, not a, what do you teach them? Okay. Um, a question. Yeah. I wanted to understand in terms of research, uh, one of the parameters, uh, when we've got a lot of data, uh, the goal of uh, having a look at this data is to take some actions. Computers are able to handle a huge amount of parameters. Humans are not. Most of the time, we are, when we want to decide about an action, we are in front of, of a uh, huge amount of parameters, and what we are looking for is one map of parameters, which is the trigger. So the, the, the main point would be, is there anything that is... Uh, uh, being done in order to simplify uh, the models, no matter what uh, kind of uh, data is governed, a lot of uh, data can be governed, a lot of parameters can be uh, developed, and most of the time what we're looking for is for a specific um, event, what is the initial trigger, though? A small amount of parameters that are, uh, in fact, creating this, uh, uh -huh. this final event. Okay. Anybody want to answer? Well, the, the answer that comes to mind, I, I like how uh, Professor Ullman put it. So one word, regularization, right? So I mean, we, can, we have the potential to overfit with fancy models and with large amounts of data. And so we need to introduce a penalty into the models for being overly complex. And if we put regularization that does that and increases the chance that we'll discover the simple needle in a haystack to use that, uh, that metaphor. So there is a general approach to what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, that you're a little bit uh, combining two types of statistical analysis. So the, statist the traditional statistical analysis of, uh, of a statistician would be um, that you're taking all of the data that you have and you're trying to make statistically significant statements. Okay, this feature is really important and so I should measure it and sh should base my decisions on it. Um, in a lot of the things that are going on, like in uh, uh, companies that are doing um, um, technical trading, that are using computers to tr predict the, f the, the, the future, they don't look for this kind of very high statistical significance because 
um, what is important is in the long-term average that you'll do better than random guessing. Then you'll make a lot of money. So it really depends on, on exactly how, how critical is this one decision that you're going to make, or is it really a series of many, many small decisions? Actually, you, you, you gave the example of the um, uh, hurricane, trying to find out what will be the, the correct parameters to follow in order to know this might happen soon. Mm, there are a lot of uh, other scientific subjects such, a, such as uh, electronics where you, you find a problem, you need to find out what is maybe not the, the only um, uh, origin of the problem, but at least something that says, well, you've got a problem early in the stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? Can you please comment on the influence all the research has on the data itself? Because suppose you recommend someone to buy something and mm -hmm. Many people do that buying, so you bias the data. And o not all the data is physical data. Most of the data all people here were relating to is human data. So can you uh, relate to that? Um, so yeah, I think that this, this is a very good point. It comes up in, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, types of applications where you're trying to, you're recommending or you're warning against or you're saying, choose these, this route or that route. Um, it, is, um, it is, in those situations, you need to in some way expand between the, the classical analysis, which is IID, the, the, all of the examples that you get are IID, and uh, where many people are going with that is to reinforcement learning or things like that. So basically you're trying not to just find what is the right prediction, you're trying to uh, optimize some kind of long-term goal. Any, anything else? There's actually a term for that called the Matthew effect. Uh, it actually comes from the Christian Bible about the rich getting richer. Uh, it's, I think it's a well-known phenomenon, for example, that if, uh, if your book gets into the top 10 list of, of what Amazon shows people, a lot of people will buy it who never would have intended to. That will in turn motivate Amazon to, uh, to keep showing your book. Uh, there isn't much you can do about that, I, I, I don't think. It, it, it's, it's gonna, uh, no, you can. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I guess for a book I can see, I, I, think, yeah. I think, okay, there is two issues here. One, yeah. I think there is, the issue, there is another issue which is sort of you have a bias in your sample. And can you unbias the sample, right? So, so for example, if we stay with the example of the books, so you, if, if you're Amazon, you'd probably want to handle differently people who bought the book with a recommendation and people who bought the book without a recommendation for your learning engine. Right. So, yeah, I, I believe there are algorithms that try to compensate for that effect yeah. in search. I mean, I don't know if Amazon necessarily does, but you can imagine that uh, search engines, right, update the ranking based on clicks. So if a result is in the top and somebody clicks on it, that's a lot less interesting than if it's result number 11 and somebody clicks on it. So you can imagine that your update algorithm would uh, give more weight to uh, clicks lower down. And, uh, and there's a number of things you can imagine doing, and uh, I haven't studied them, but there are probably people here who uh, who have, uh, there's diversity-based uh, algorithms, there's exploration, exploitation type of things to see, well, what if you mixed it up, right? What if you took a book from number 20 and put it in number five, what would happen? So, um, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so one of the, the questions that, that um, I sometimes think of is, okay, you have this m magnanimous collection of uh, data, um, how do you know if you really need it all? Or is, do you need it all? Do you, can you just do sample 10% of it and get essentially almost the same result? Well, I think, I think there are very good examples for, uh, for uh, sparsifying, uh, sparsifying data. And uh, you, have, uh, you acquire a huge amount of data and many, many uh, research efforts are, are uh, exactly in this direction. Mm. Try to find uh, typical examples and, and, and clusters of data and 
and select only one, one, uh, one typical example from each cluster in order to, uh, in order to reduce the, the amount of data. And I think this should be one of the major efforts in, mm. uh, in, in dealing with huge amounts of data, this, the process of sparsification. Mm. So in terms of the challenges of uh, big data, in terms of where we want to be, um, where do you think we should be, we're not as good as we would like to be, whether is it like statistical analysis of the data, machine learning type techniques, or is it, uh, like Ishai mentioned, parallel computation where we should advance our efforts, or uh, Jeff mentioned LSH or various algorithmic tricks like that. So is it computational the statistics that you think we should be focusing on? Or we're not as good as we would like to be? Uh, definitely all of the above. I mean, uh, I mean uh, ser seriously. Um, a competent data scientist, we can argue about, you know, what their background has to be and their, their attitude toward trying new things and so on, but, but the more algorithms you have under your command, uh, the, the more effective you're going to be. Uh, the, uh, you know, I, I, I got to say, one of the things that has really annoyed me about AI <laughs> is there are these people who go around saying, it's all neural nets, you know, or it's all genetic algorithms, you know. Genetic algorithms can do anything better than anybody else can do it. And they know one, they're, they're, they're one-trick ponies. They, sometimes they're right. I mean, sometimes they're al their favorite algorithm is the best thing to do. But, uh, but, but so, you know, a, a, the really competent scientists know all the algorithms and all the things you can do. Uh, I, I like, you know, the, the analogy I'd like to, to bring to mind, uh, the operations research community. This was something from 50, 60 years ago. Uh, some ve very excellent uh, s scientists developed a body of algorithms. Uh, simplex was just maybe the, the, the first, the best known of them, but there's a, a whole collection of, you know, matching and, and modeling things of various sorts, you know, and the good, good ones would know everything and would be able to go to a, um, you, know, a, you know, a business or something and, and help them the way they needed to be helped rather than the way the OR type person wanted to help them. Okay, that, I think that makes a big difference in, uh, hmm. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the, uh, yeah, that's, that's very important. The other thing that I would add along a different dimension is the, the usability of the tools. Right. So it's still the case, right, that when you have an application, it takes a highly trained person or a set of people a really long time uh, to finally come up with the models that work, whether they're statistical models or machine learning models. And so to the extent that we can make the tools uh, more usable to the extent that we can change the equation from 99% uh, uh, perspiration and you know 1% machine uh, to to be a little bit more uh, invested in the machine. I think that would be better. And if you look at something like Weka or one of these uh, tools that are used throughout, it's really the I don't know the ma the machine code or assembly uh, of these things. I, I would conjecture that over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna have much more sophisticated, much more automated, and also much more visual uh, tools that allow people who are trained to do things a lot faster and allow people who are less trained also to do some things, which of course uh, can be highly problematic, but we already have these problems as, as, uh, uh, as, as you pointed out. So here's sort of one challenge that I think would, would sort of would get back to it, everything that was said. Think of big data for small companies. So even if you run a small company with 20, 30 people, you still have a huge amount of data, probably, that is gathering around. But you cannot afford to have an extra 20 people doing the data analysis. So, so in order for this vision to go ahead, in order to get the long tail inside the big data, a lot more needs to be done. It needs to be done in such a way that even if you didn't graduate in computer science or statistics and don't have anyone in your organization that did it, you still will be able to benefit 50% of what big data can offer you. Right. I mean, I think uh, one the, for me the, the challenge is, uh, can we make a tool that will tell you what's on your disk? 
uh, because basically I, you know, I have like a laptop with 500 gigabyte. I don't know what's on there. I really don't. And uh, there's no easy way to do it. There are some scanning tools that take a long time and then they tell you, okay, all of this is music and all of this is... But, but something that would literally take, you know, some disk that was um, collected uh, on some, using some machine that was standing in the field for 10 years and now has a lot of data, and you just want to sit there and basically say, is any of this data good? Uh, should I use it? Uh, what's roughly in it? Um, all of these kind of high-level tools, they just uh, are not in existence yet because, because the data just grew, the, the disks basically grew so big that we're just, oh, it's great, we just have now one terabyte in our machine. So, um, so I think that, yeah, definitely tools that would, that would like, let you do very simple things uh, but, but on significantly large amounts of data uh, that, that is, I think, would be a great, great advantage. Uh, I, I remember in the, in the heydays of uh, neural networks, when it started, uh, everybody was very excited about it, and, uh, and, uh, and everybody was solving every problem with neural networks. And then uh, I, got, I got to, to Bell Labs, and uh, I think John Denker, or, or, or one mm -hmm. of these uh, good old uh, neural network guys, said, Oh, this is really a very, very wonderful method. It's, it's, the, it's the universal second best way to, sol uh, to solve every problem. And, uh, and uh, there, is, there was a lot of wisdom in this thing because, because, because here is a guy who, who, who has this tool. This tool is doing a lot of things for him. But you have to realize that it's the second best thing because the best thing is probably something that is adapted to the to the problem at hand, and you cannot have a universal solution for the for the for the for for each and every problem uh, uh, that that you are in, that you are going to encounter. So I think um, I very much agree with Jeff about the fact that that one has to have an open mind and has to has to know a lot of a lot of uh, tools. And actually, the recent developments show you that. Uh, things think things are coming back have a have a have a trend of of coming back to you you know good old good old methods that were good in some time they 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 are coming back with a new twist with a new with a new thing the the, the one thing that that troubles me about your disk example is uh, it's that it's a it's a universal problem everybody has this the biggest problem with this is that sometimes the data that we acquire is not is not readable anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not only it's not only that it's 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 there and we haven't read it or we haven't looked at it, but uh, the, the 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 tools to deal with those data are not are not uh, effective anymore. Right. So how do we deal with this with this problem? Build a cemetery for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Any questions from the audience? Yes. I, I want to go back uh, to what Professor Etzioni mentioned before that today big data poses a situation where we have um, a small amount of labeled data and copious amount of unlabeled data. So, um, yeah, well, we can say that uh, one question is how to sample the data and whether it has the same distribution, but uh, more interestingly, inter interesting is how can we use the unlabeled data and because you can maybe some, uh, apply some logic and rules in order to have a labeled noisy data, which is 10 times more or 1,000 times uh, uh, more uh, uh, data than uh, it was when, when it was manually labeled. So if you can elaborate more from your experience, how can you use unlabeled data for some tasks? Sure, I'm sure l lots of people have experience with this. Let me just mention three ideas that I've found useful and there's more. So first of all, right, there is the notion of uh, semi-supervised learning and the word semi there is misleading. Basically it means, right, some subset of the data is labeled and then some other subset of the data which is unlabeled can be labeled either directly or probabilistically based on things like the distance between the unlabeled data elements and the labeled one, right? So if an unlabeled data point is close to several data points that are labeled plus, you'll take the unlabeled one, you label it plus. And there's some very elegant algorithms along those lines. Uh, another technique that people have been using recently in natural language processing in particular is called uh, distance supervision. 
So what if I can take a bunch of text and I can identify, uh, I can use a very large database uh, to label the text. So for example, let's say it's a database of products and this is text about products. Now I can intersect effectively uh, the text and the database and say, okay, I've got lots of examples of these uh, products in here. So effectively, I can uh, generate labels or, um, or noisy labels by intersection with a database. And then third, my, my favorite example, in the case of uh, price prediction, where the problem is whether it's travel or other goods, and you say the price today is $1,000, uh, in a week or two, where's the price going? Is it going to go up or going to go down? So we can think of this as a simple categorization problem. I have a data point today, the price, and I want to label it as going up or going down, say, relative to a week from now. Well, all, all I have to do is wait the passage of time. A week from now, I can label the data point from today. So in fact, at Faircast, for example, we ended up with close to a trillion labeled data points simply by waiting. Uh, 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 by, the, by the passage of time. So that's a domain-specific example, but the point is often when you look at your domain and your data, you can think of clever domain-specific ideas to extend uh, the amount of data that you have labeled. And, yeah. So just to pick up on this, I think it's a very active research area in, in machine learning. So part of it is something that is called, let's say, domain adaptation in which you have you learn on one domain and then you want to extend the results to other domain, like a typical example would be sentiment analysis. You run a sentiment analysis classifier for hotels, you want to apply it to for books or for electronics or for some other domain. So, so people are actively looking at this issue and a related issue is sort of multitask learning, trying to learn a few tasks together rather than trying to learn each one by isolation. Actually, with, with, this, uh, exactly, with this example, you can use a uh, label data which is noisy as the number of stars, which is... You don't have always stars. So the, the sentiment analysis is really trying to build when you don't have the stars. You have, okay, from one data, you had the stars and you learned hotels. From the other the data, you don't have stars, but you still want to, to learn the sentiment. Um, is it feasible uh, to increase the efficiency of uh, big data and uh, machine learning by uh, standardization? For example, uh, have a standard for uh, presenting a query in a search engine, have a standard for provide a reply of a search engine, um, have a standard for a web page, etc., etc. If you compare to communication, the breakthrough come with standardiz standardiz standardization of the packet in the air, of the packet in the network, etc. Your question reminds me of, uh, of the following joke that they went and they asked Gandhi, um, uh, what about Western civilization? And he said it would be a very good idea. <laughs> So standardization is an obviously wonderful idea, but you know, look at look at look outside what is happening, and look at the fact that uh, it's exactly it's, it's exactly connected to, to to the question that I raised before. Uh, how many of us have uh, have uh, files and 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 uh, and data in formats that we cannot read anymore because 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 the, the things have changed on us. And uh, therefore, this is a tremendous problem, and I think, uh, and I think we'll have to deal with it. So it's a very good idea. Okay. So um, thank you very much, and thank uh, the panel.